Anno Domini 935. The Vikings have invaded the Great Isles. The great city of Dublin, known at this time as Athcliath, is the stronghold of King Citric. The clans of Eru have paid enormous tribute to this new king, and with these riches, the city has become the cornerstone of the economy and life in Midgard. Within the city, the Vikings, the Gaels, and the Christians find ways to work together. The tensions are fueled by the aristocracy, the politicians, and the merchants of this great city. Come and explore Athcliath. Find adventure around every corner of this ever-growing, dynamic city. Within the Athcliath box set, you will find dozens of buildings detailed right down to their occupants. Glorious maps of the city. A rule book for the Fate of the Norns Ragnarok role-playing game. A character generation book. A set of Elder Futhark runes. A city usable in any role-playing game. But that's not all, you see. This is the ultimate Viking Anthology Kickstarter. Five more books that expand the Fate of the Norns universe. You get a novel written by Ed Greenwood based in this very city, Athcliath. You also get a novel written by Stephen Pearl, continuing the adventures of the warband found within the pages of The Horn of the Kraken. You also get a novel written by Michelle Franklin, recounting yet more misadventures of poor old Mindel, the monk who made his debut in Creatures from Fairy Tale and Myth. You also get a graphic novel by Andrew Volkoskis and Jonathan Borello, the hilarious funny Erbiga Saga. And finally, you also get a graphic novel by Andrew Volkoskis and Vincent Pompetti, the epic tale of Vargesa the Firewolf. You may need a spare bookshelf of extra sturdy oak to hold this mega Viking anthology when it gets to your doorstep. Come along and join the adventure. Join the Kickstarter and become a backer of the mega Viking anthology. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Epic Realms. I am your host, Nick, and today we've got two special guests. These special guests are here to talk about the Ultimate Viking Anthology. Our first guest has been here before. He's a legendary author and probably most well known for his creation of Forgotten Realms. He is the great, awesome Ed Greenwood. Hello, Ed. How are you doing? I'm fine. Hi. And also joining us, Andrew Velkoskis, creator of Fate of the Norns, RPG. He's an author, writer, and he is also a streamer right here on Twitch. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Andrew. Bull. <laughs> Bull. Nice. Uh, so I want to start off right off the top, Andrew. Ed's been on the show before. Ed's great. He's a great supporter of ours. We haven't chatted with you on the stream before, so it's great to have you on. Tell us a little bit about, about yourself and kind of how you got into the gaming industry real quick. Uh, well, I've been a gamer since, uh, oh boy, a long time ago when Ed and I started talking about gaming. We're talking about like old ratty boxes that have fallen apart, with tiny little dice that needed little crayons to see the numbers. Um, so that's, that's where it all began. And uh, the love affair uh, was quickly replaced by a lot of house rules uh, at our gaming table by the late 80s. And what we ended up realizing is our house rules were starting to get a little bit thicker than the actual games we were playing. And we said, well, this is kind of getting kind of silly and out of hand. Why don't we just make our own RPG that kind of covers everything that we want in a game? And so we're in about 92, 93, Fate of the Norns was born. Um, and pretty much for about 10 years, it was as it was, just kind of like a, a dice system. Uh, we used percentile dice back in the day. And uh, in 2002 or so, I think we introduced like a life path system that had Elder Futhark runes kind of bolted on there. And that kind of got my head kind of scratching going, hmm, there's something to these runes. And it was around the same time that the Euro board game explosion came into uh, North America. And when that, when the board games came in here, I mean, they completely redefined how board games are played around the table. Like just the fun level went through the roof. Uh, it was all about the player dynamics 
the the healthy player experience like the player experience came first and then the game mechanics came afterwards and so by kind of reversing that paradigm um the runes ended up allowing us to do a lot of really interesting things uh by putting the player experience first and so uh, by around 2006, uh, we ended up doing a runic version of Fate of the Norns, which we fast forwarded to Ragnarok. And then my kids were born. And at that point, well, I was just pretty much all consumed. And I said, forget about all of this. And everything went on a shelf uh, for the next couple of years. And it only came back in about 2012. And it was about 30 years old. And people started email me, are you guys doing anything for Fate of the Norns? It's 30 years old. You should do something to commemorate it. And we were like, Oh my God, 30 years. E. That's, that's, that's really dating us. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so we put out the very first manuscript of the 92 edition. So there's just kind of like for shits and giggles. And that was like an old word, perfect document. Yeah. Um, and used all the public domain art that was out there. And uh, once that was out, we didn't realize how big of a, a crowd was out there. Uh, Cause as soon as that came out, we had a bunch of people knocking down our doors. When's Ragnarok coming out? And we're like, Ooh, we just used up all of the free art. That means we need to start paying for stuff now. Yeah. Uh-oh, uh, this is getting too high risk. And uh, people told us about Kickstarter, and now we're running our 13th Kickstarter. So that's kind of the the whole, what, 40 years? Wow. 30 that's years crazy. in yeah. a nutshell, yeah. So now, what is the connection? Is, is Pendlehaven Publishing, is that just, like, part of Fate of the Norns? Did you, like, just go, like, well, we're just going to publish ourselves? and you know call ourselves a publisher or was it something separate you had going on so pendlehaven was my it company back in the 90s uh so i i was an it guy for god knows how long uh and i hung that up in 2012 to try and do this full time uh because i pretty much was told by anyone in the industry that unless you do this full time you're pretty much going to hold on to your day job and this is going to be like a, a a weekend gig for you right if you really want this to work you gotta like you know just burn the ships at the coast, there's no retreat and charge. And so that's what I ended up doing. And um, so Pendlehaven basically ended up morphing from IT company to publishing company uh, around 2012, 2013. So it's uh, it's still, I think, listed under both. We do both, but uh, mostly publishing now. Okay. And what, what started your, your love for Vikings? Like, how did that all start? Well, I would say... I've always loved history and mythology and fairy tales. Um, I mean, when my grandmother came over from Lithuania, she used to read like fairy tales to me when I was going to bed. And that used to just, just get the imagination going like crazy. It's just one of the fondest memories uh, back in the day. And when we started role-playing, it was always based in some sort of folklore uh, rooted in, you know, our, our past shared experiences. And uh, I think we settled on um norse mythology thanks to mr ward's deities and demigods or legends and lore okay because we had at our disposal pretty much just a huge compendium of all the mythologies of the world or a, a good chunk um and and that book was a big inspiration and, and we kind of flipped through and said all right our rpg is going to have to be based on one of these which one are we most excited about and we just settled on norse and that was the 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 i guess the 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 roulette result <laughs> nice. Ed, you, you and I have talked about your love for history and things like that. Did you have a specific connection with, with the Norse, uh, you know, separate from any of the other folklores? No, just, just uh, reading and enjoying um, all of the different tales, which, of course, depending on what source you get them from, contradict horribly. Yeah, right. And in fact, if you want to see really cool, check out the illustrated Edda that Andrew did. Which is not only a gorgeous book, but he he is explaining to you as you read through it how he's reconciling this version with this version with this version, because you have to pick one if you're going to tell a coherent story. Right. So no, I, for me it was in fact I remember the Gen Con. It was in um, Milwaukee, um, University of Milwaukee Parkside, um, in which they released the original deities and demigods, and they opened the doors and we all sprinted down two flights of steps to the basement where the cloakroom was for the university. And they were behind the counter just selling them as fast as they could. And five minutes later, they were all sold out. And we all relaxed and started breathing. <laughs> and and uh, everybody else went, banged open the doors because the Wisconsin Parkside campus, you're in a park. 
that, you know, they would bang open the glass doors and go and sit on the lawn and read it. And I went straight to the folding plastic table that was the dragon booth to be get hired, in quotation marks. Right. I say hired because there was no salary, to be Dragon's contributing editor. So... <laughs> <laughs> and how did you guys end up meeting up was it was it andrew just coming to you and be like do you want to work on this with me or was it like you came to him or you just mutual friends what we, we did panels together yeah andrew you tell it yeah yeah no, no, no. we were we were at fan expo for yeah. many years together uh sharing uh the stage on panels uh so it's uh, fan expo is in toronto so around ed's hometown okay. it's a pretty big convention and we'd be on panels for like you know gming 101 um kickstarting you know how to run uh creating a game world things like that and uh i don't know we just hit it off like right off the bat like we'd be sitting uh, we joked around like a couple of hot mics before the panel even started and we'd be like joking around and people would be like what are they saying what are these jokes <laughs> and we're like are these things on <laughs> oh dear <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then you know he, he'd pass by the booth check out what we did and uh, i gifted him uh a illuminated edda and he was so kind to say ah oh, you know if you want i can give you an endorsement for your your cover and i was like damn absolutely so we've got ed's uh, wonderful words emblazoned on the back cover um of three and a half years of my life between two covers um <laughs> and uh and then we said well you know why don't we try some doing something together and um i've always wanted to do a city box set um i have such fond memories of the the old city box sets and stomping around in them or through them for you know year year-long campaigns two years um and at the top of my list if there was anyone in the industry that i would actually just choose ed would have been at the top even if i didn't know him i would have gone like all right i gotta i gotta email this guy you know and then bonus i know the guy yeah so and he's a fun guy and right. so I said, Ed, how about we collab on a nice um, on a nice box set? And he's like, and can I write a novel in for that box set too for your world? And I'm like, hell's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and... in. <laughs> that's Someone awesome. lets me write novels. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a really cool story because, you know, one of my questions was going to be like, how much did Ed know about Fate of the Norns before he kind of came on it? Obviously, you knew quite a bit you are a fan of the work uh how does that feel for you andrew to be like hey ed's a fan of my work i'm i'm still surprised people know who the hell we are even after 10 years of doing this because seriously like when we started this in 2012 uh when we published the first manuscript i thought like we would just publish 20 books and we'd be the only 20 people in this world that knew about this thing that we'd been doing as a passion project for the last 20 years and when it got out there and we sold like 90% of that in two weeks uh, of our minimum print run and people were clamoring for other stuff, I'm like, who the hell is playing our game out there? Like, because if you think about it, back in the 90s, we didn't have like drive through RPG or anything like that. It was pretty much like we had a crummy little website on, I don't even remember what the what those website companies were. It's like Yahoo or, I don't know, Alta Vista. I yeah, can't yeah. even remember. You'd, you'd mount some sort of website and then people would contact you and be like, I'd send you a three and a half inch diskette uh, with, uh, with you know, a, a password protected document and just, I don't know, mail me $2 <laughs> in the mail or something. Right, right. You know? Angel and Fire gonna, website. <laughs> Angel Fire, Stuff there like we go. Um, and so, and then, you know, we started doing conventions in 2013, 2014. And, at the beginning, you know, you're telling everyone like what Fate of the Norns is. And then eventually, like, we just hit this tipping point where, you know, you, you get into the spiel of, oh, well, welcome to our booth. You know, this is Fate. And they're like, hey, we have all your stuff. What's new? What What's the new stuff that you've got? And, and it just feels so nice to, to finally be at that point. And so um, I don't even remember the original question. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> that's, that's enough information. That, that's great. That's, so we had, when we had Ed on earlier in the year here, uh, we talked about his his project that he was working on. He could only talk about you know so much of it, but he talked about the city and what was coming up. And he uh, he he's like, "You're right back." Um, but he was putting it together, and he talked about. It and I was like, "Man, it would be really cool if when you guys kickstart that, if we can have both of you on to talk about it." And he's like, "Yeah, that would be really awesome." So just on a whim, I messaged him. A couple of weeks ago and i was like hey you know i'm scheduling out you know i'm scheduled out till march uh hopefully you know you guys know have a date set that when you're going to be releasing 
releasing the Kickstarter. Oh yeah, I just found out today. We're going to be doing it next week. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, we're going to do a bonus episode then if you guys are available. And uh, and so here you are. Well, thanks for having us on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something we wanted to do earlier in the year. Uh, we were even geared to do this around GaryCon of okay. this year. Um, the issue is like, I'm, I'm a stickler for getting a project out before we start another project. Right. And so we were with children of you and we were behind schedule. And then we had like a bunch of editing issues and layout issues at the end. We were at, like 800 pages. We had to cut the page count down without compromising content or art. Oh, and wow. so we got the book down to like 500 pages by July. Uh, it was a huge effort to get to that point without compromising like the integrity of the book. And then... Uh, you know, with everything, with the delays of printing and shipping and all of that, I mean, we just really got around to just now being able to deliver uh, Children of Area in print. And so at this point, I can say, okay, now we can pull the trigger on this Kickstarter because it's been ready to go for at least like, almost, I'd say a year. Nice. Well, let's talk about the Kickstarter. Uh, you've got kind of an all-star cast of people that are working on this Kickstarter. Obviously, the Amazing. two of you... You know, obviously you, yourself, Ed, um, but you let, let me look at this list here. Michelle Franklin, Stephen Pearl, Vincent Pompetti, Jonathan Borello, uh, Andrew, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Franger. Franger. All right. And Yulia Novakova? Yep. You got it. Like, that's that's a list of people that have some works out there. I mean, that's that's pretty awesome. How did you get all those people together? Um, so a lot of these people I've worked with before. Um, so for example, let's start with Stephen Pearl. Uh, he is an established author that had come and uh, wrote a novel in our universe already called The Horn of the Kraken. So he was someone I also met at Fan Expo years and years ago. And um, I remember his wife was going, you guys should do something together. You guys should do something together. And she pushed Smith and Wesson together. And lo and behold, we've got a novel and, and two adventures that came out of that one. And then uh, he just wrote the sequel to it, which is The Mistletoe Spear. And he's, his art, uh, his writing style is, is really just action-oriented, like perfect action movie. And uh, his novels I describe as like Viking heists. So picture <laughs> like Ocean's Eleven meets Lord of the Rings. Wow. Um, so it's like perfect for uh, Viking sagas, like to write adventures for our role-playing game afterwards. Um, and so he's he's got a trilogy in the works. So this is book two that uh, we're kickstarting with him. Uh, Michelle Franklin, we've worked with as well. Uh, so she's also an established author. And on the uh, before last project, which was Creatures from Fairy Tale and Myth, uh, which was three books that we were releasing. Uh, one of them was a storybook about uh, creatures from fairy tales that are amazing, but underrated and should be brought back into the forefront for not only gaming, but just, you know, in literature. So that book that Ed's holding up right now is the book that deals with just fairy tales. So it's picture authors that have been hired to write brand new fairy tales, reimagining these creatures. And then we have like a, I guess, system agnostic section where we talk about how you would potentially use these creatures in storytelling and in, in role-playing games, any role-playing game. And then we released a version of that for 5e and a version of that book for our uh, Fate of the Norns Ragnarok system. Um, so she came in as a hired gun cause we were coming, we were coming like really behind schedule and I couldn't write all the stories I wanted to run. And I was like, Michelle, can you come in and just like write a couple, maybe under some sort of theme, maybe one person that's like, um, encountering these, uh, fairies and, and creatures and make it a little bit more humorous because everyone else that's kind of writing stuff is getting a little bit too serious. Maybe we should you know, have a little bit more of a well-rounded uh, set of fairy tales. And she came up with Mindel, the missionary. And so picture this guy like a, a mix between Gru the Wanderer and um, uh, Rincewind from uh, this world, this kind of like hapless missionary that means well, but everything just blows up and <laughs> catches fire all around him. Um, it works out for him, but everyone else is just like, oh dear God, what is happening? Um, so he, he goes and meets all these fairy creatures in fairy tale and tries to convert them to Christianity. So, uh, <laughs> and it goes well. <laughs> yes. I love the, fa the fairy queen one was uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so she comes back with a novel called the misadventures of Mindel. And so he is traipsing through our, our universe 
and actually goes through Athgliath, which is the project we'll talk about after with uh, that Ed yeah. and I are working on the city. Um, and then who else can we talk about? So there's Ed's novel. I think I'll let Ed speak to about his novel. He's here, and then we'll I'll talk about the others. Yeah, Ed, talk about oh. your novel. Give, oh, okay. give us give us so, the info. Four one one. Okay, okay. There are I think two scenes in the novel. One at the beginning where they're arriving by ship, and one near the end where somebody's um, on a barge at night that are not strictly speaking within the city walls everything else in the book is takes place within the city walls it in michelle's novel there are some key scenes in the city mindel does visit the city the one man wrecking crew uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but my entire book the one-eyed king and it's called that because king citrix warren who's on the th the river feet throne ruling Athcliath, uh, is a devout worshiper of Odin. So as a teenager, he blotted to Odin. He did a sacrifice. He plucked out one of his eyes because Odin is missing an eye. Right. So and he, he, pl he plucked out his own eye with his own hand and cast it in a brazier, burned it to Odin. So he's the one-eyed king. And if you've read your Terry Pratchett, he aspires to be the patrician. The ruler of Ankh-Morpork. Park. He isn't there yet, but he's trying to be the sort of Viking who plays people off against people and outthinks them in his three or four steps ahead. Okay. And because of that, he's giving the Hibernians, the Irish, who were in that whole area first before the Vikings conquered it, he's giving them their own justice system alongside the Norse justice system, which you'll see. It's actually detailed in the box set, which I'll get to later because I won't talk about it now because Andrew's going to say. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but what we see in the novel is two young Hibernians who don't know about each other when the novel begins, but they happen to come on the same um, ship into the city, and they both have a mission. And I won't tell you what the mission is in detail, but I will tell you that the first sentence of the of the body text of the novel is, I am come to kill the king. Now, it's then it then does Fawford and Grey Moser on you. If you like Lankmar, uh, you suddenly find yourself plunged as these two innocents fish out of water who are in the big city for the first time, and they have a mission. And they have people they're supposed to contact and they're trying to figure out how to do this impossible mission how do you get into this palace and kill this king he's got guards everywhere they're patrolling the streets the king's soldiers and they're trying to and they're going wow at this city you see as the world darkens because it's fate of the norns it's ragnarok or is it it's the celtic twilight or is it but the world is darkening the sun has gone from the sky the crops are failing and all the money and wealth and power in the world seems to be rushing into this one city, the city of golden slaves, which Citric is encouraging. So all the big power brokers in the world are suddenly on the streets of this city. And they're just like, gosh, wow, in the middle of it. So like the way that Fawford and Grey Moser would go through cities and have little adventures, they are having little adventures. It's somewhat darker than Fawford and Grimmauser because these are two young innocents. And at the same time, we immediately get to see all sorts of other people in the city because once they've crossed paths or brushed shoulders with somebody, I pop to that character. So okay. you, you as the reader get to see all of these things weaving together and you get to see the king responding. The king has secret agents that everybody knows about, you know, the, the secret police that mm -hmm. the whole city is scared of called the Shadow Hands. And you'll get to see them doing their thing and the king giving them orders. And he has a, an envoy, Bull Under the Voice, who's a complete, so funny. he's a pompous ass. <laughs> and the king They're my favorite characters, my favorite characters are the pompous assholes. <laughs> yeah. And the king sends him all over the city because one of the things the king has to deal with is the fact that there are Hibernian Irish nobles in this city uh, still hanging on that haven't left and haven't been killed, haven't died fighting the king, 
there are at least four major ones that we'll see in the book. One of them used to grace the king's bed. Oh. And um, <clears throat> uh, he still sort of has the hots for her and probably vice versa because they 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 sort of like silken daggers drawn at each other. And and we'll get to see what happens. And of course, that's the other thing. It's the city of gold and slaves. Slave dealing goes on here. Now, if you want to do something illicit in the city, one of the easiest ways to distract all the king's soldiers who are patrolling pretty heavily is to stage a slave break. That's always fun. Wow. So there's a <laughs> lot of stuff going on in the book is what you're saying. Yeah. So that's that's excellent. Is there so and, and I don't know if both of you can tell me or if Andrew knows is it, do you guys because there's more than one novel there's the graphic novels as well. Um, is are we going to see any like characters even cameo in any of the other you know like a character from Ed's book show up in Michelle's stuff or like somebody from one of the graphic novels just kind of pops by? Is there any little crossover there of any main characters? Well, the next one that I'm going to get into, which is the Vergesa the Firewolf, she will appear definitely in the Athkleath box set because she's one of the most important characters in uh, in the Fade and Norns universe. Mm -hmm. And she's kind of the anti-hero. She's one of these, um, she ties two mythologies together because uh, her her from her mother's side, she's actually tied to the um, the gods and goddesses of the Finnish people. Oh. Uh, so Luhi of Piola. Uh, so this is from the Kalevala, um, the, the, the that side of the myths, and um, she her you in her youth she was actually saved uh, by something Loki did for her, and now that Loki is bound in Virgilmere uh, after the death of Baldur, she's on a mission to free him uh, during the first Age of Ragnarok from Virgilmere, and consequences be damned about the rest of the three ages of Ragnarok. And you can imagine the forces that are working against her uh, in this quest, but she also has uh, a lot of allies that she knows and does not know about that are helping her along her journey. And so Vergesa the Firewolf is one of our graphic novels, and that's the one I'm working with Vincent Pompetti. So he, he and I started collaborating on our Patreon, and uh, that Patreon basically snowballed into uh, a graphic novel. Um, and so it's going to be a full-sized one. If you can picture the graphic novels that come from France, like from Elric and things like that, that style, okay. uh, full color, um, almost full-sized. Um, and so Vergesa is going to make uh, an appearance. She's made an appearance already in, in the novel Scythe and Sword. She's in two of the big uh, expansion books that we have for our world, and she'll be in the city for sure. Uh, and then the last one is um, a comic book version of um, Erbiga's saga. And that's that's a mouthful. A lot of people look at that and they're like, how the hell do I pronounce that? And Ed and I were like, Ed's like, if I'm doing the voiceover for this, you're going to need to come online with me and tell me, how, <laughs> how do I pronounce this word? <laughs> wow. That, that one was a tough one. Uh, and it was in for me. I had to take a couple Make of tries on <laughs> And so uh, it started with Jonathan and I. Um, we wanted to bring uh, the Viking sagas to the masses. And what happened is now that with um, a lot of the print-on-demand, a lot of professors have been able to take their academic translations of the Icelandic sagas and Norse sagas and put them on Amazon. And a lot of people buy them and they're like, oh, these are fantastic. And then they start reading them and next thing they know, they're like... <sighs> They just yeah. fall asleep. And it's just the academic translation is a little dry. So what we wanted to do was to produce a accurate translation in a comic book format. So tell the actual story, uh, but with like over the top humor because Erbiga Saga is, if you can picture every Viking trope that we know about is yeah. packed into this saga. <laughs> and it's like a Coen Brothers saga. So yeah. you've got a bunch of these like storylines of different families weaving together and they culminate into this explosive ending at the end. Um, and so uh, Jonathan and I started working on this and then I realized with my hand in so many pots in this Kickstarter and when we added a dozen other industry veterans as stretch goals, that they're going to start writing adventures for our Athkleath box set, that my time is going to get like thinner and thinner on each one right. of these projects. 
I figured there's one person that I could definitely at the top of my list, just like Ed for the box set. Uh, Andy Franger is a professor of medieval studies, um, and he has a podcast with his co-host, another professor, John, and I can't remember his last name right now, sorry. Do you remember um, the name of the podcast? Uh, saga Thing. Fantastic. What they do is they, they dissect the sagas in a most entertaining way. And we had them on our fireside chat um, uh, stream. And when I was mentioning Airbiga Saga, you could just see Andy's face light up. He was just like, oh, this one, I love it. It's so close to my heart. It's one of my favorites. And so when I said, I need to, I need a co-writer. I need someone to help me, you know, pace this thing through the page count that we need and uh, get a character list for Jonathan so he can get the characterization of all these characters. Uh, and he's like, sign me up. Let's do this. So he, he joined the Kickstarter about a week before we launched. So nice. um, it's, it's absolutely uh, an all-star cast. And I can't forget uh, Yulia. So she is our, um, our lead artist on the Fate of the Norns line right now for the Celtic books. So she's the lead artist for um, the Celtic Cyclopedia, the uh, Children of Eru that just launched, and Athcleath, the box set. So pretty much most of the art that you guys see out there is done by by her and she's an absolute superstar like one of these yeah, that art that, it's gorgeous all of that art is gorgeous and it's so unique it's it's one of this eye-catching eye uh eye-catching style that when people walk by the booth and they just do like a double take and like what is that right and they just immediately have to just like touch the books and <laughs> it's not enough to just look at it that they touch just need it. to touch rub right their there. hand <laughs> on, on the cover oh <laughs> let me feel this art we, we were talking <laughs> earlier off off uh off recording about saying naughty things on the stream and so like i was like hmm can we go here yeah we can go there we can go there <laughs> the the fans get sensual with their art let's put it that way <laughs> all right so let's talk about athcliff let's talk about the box set what makes this a must have for all role players not just of one genre and either of you can answer that okay okay i'll leap in okay leap in i want to do a city that will be alive that we will keep giving you new non-player characters new adventures um i tweet daily new news and rumors from the city to make it feel like you know this is the latest from Athcliath. Oh, is that what those are? I thought that those yeah. were from games that you were running and you were playing no. and you were just quoting stuff from your games. It's like, this is really cool. I wonder what this I wonder what this game is. I wish I could see it or something. I had no idea that that's what those tweets were. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. If, if you're walking in the streets, if you well, I mean you you go to a tavern or you're you're visiting the city and you you check in at an inn or you've got to eat something. So you either go and buy food and take it home and prepare it, or you go into what we would call a restaurant and in Athcliath it's an eatery and people are talking all around you it's the gossip of the day hey did you hear and that's what I'm tweeting for those wow. I mean we we want the city to be alive and I am so tired of cities that are eight buildings mainly right. blank okay in this city you go into every building and you at least get you know those Dorling Kindersley um oh yeah go ahead Andrew no, at least one person is what I was going to say. Yeah. You get at least one person per building yeah. that you're going to end up meeting um, that's fleshed out for you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, um, there, there's, a, there's a publisher called Dorling Kindersley, and they do travel books to Rome, Paris, you know, London, big cities. And you open the, one of the books, and it's got an illustration of a city block. And then, then around the edges, there'll be a little, like, one paragraph the Colossus of Rhodes, or, you know, <laughs> or the Sundial, or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but, you know, and it, it tells you, you know, more than this, um, admission on Thursdays costs this much, that sort of thing. It's the quickie, okay, we're going to do that for the entire city. And then for the southern third of the city, which is, and that, that one is easy because it gives you a city gate, it gives you the palace, it gives you the three richest blocks in the city, it gives you three of the poorest slums. It gives you a little bit of the docks. And it gives you mercantile blocks in the middle. So you get everything. Those will be so detailed. When you go into an eatery, you get a price list. 
Wow. When you go into a shop where somebody makes something and sells it to you, there'll be a thing there that tells you how good their stuff is in, in game terms. And we use a shorthand for how uh, the game stats of somebody. Um, Andrew came up with this. I think it's brilliant. Just keep it simple. Um, a percentage, like a, well, we all understand 100% to 1% um, as to where somebody is. So a newborn baby is like zero. But the moment they can toddle, they're one. And if they're God, they're 100. Okay. And most of us are in the middle somewhere. Well, you, you could just say, okay, this guy, you know, the Smith, the blacksmith hammering away. Oh, he's 75. Oh, he's really good. He can make swords of, you know, enchanted lasting worth, you know, because he's up there. Yeah, and, so, and yeah. Yeah. Go whatever ahead. system you're going to be mapping it to, you'll know the level range in that system, right? So, like in D&D, you'll say, oh, like, well, levels one to 20 or one to 30. Well, that you can transpose the, the percentile system. Yeah. on that levels one to 30. So if you know, you're meeting someone that's like level 66%, well, you know that they're around level 20 in that levels one to 30 in your game world. Right. So we'll give you where they are in kind of the, the scale of the world in relation to each other and in the scale to your universe where we would see them sitting. So like, you know, an Elminster level, you know, that level, like say 85 in that world or or something like that to be walking around in Athleath. So you can easily transpose this to Powered by the Apocalypse, Pathfinder, D&D, whatever your home system is. These very quick and intuitive stat blocks will allow you to do the transposition. That's and awesome. when we're doing a detailed character, you get a dirty secret for every character. Why do you get a dirty secret? Because Andrew has this cool thing in Fate of the Norns called social combat. So you don't actually have to draw your sword and be a Viking on everybody. You will give me this or I chop your head off. Okay. <laughs> your thumb and two fingers. We start with that. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to be like that. You don't have to be that guy. But if you do social combat, you can get somebody to tell you something, admit something, tell you a secret. Maybe you can blackmail them into more or get them to work with you. Hey, um, give me the name of the that beautiful lady i just see walking away or who is she where can i get to meet her you know that sort of thing and and you might get leverage over this character by knowing their dirty secret you also get a proclivity and a characteristic the proclivity tells the norn or dungeon master or game master okay you can extrapolate everything from this character because we're telling you what the character is after in life this character is greedy this character will seize any any opportunity. Oh, you're adventurers? Good. I want you to and and they'll this character will try and frame you or manipulate you or dupe you into doing something nasty to his trade rival. Like if he's one jeweler and there's another jeweler two blocks away, he wants that jeweler taken down. Right. So he'll try and drive you there. And then the last thing is a characteristic. This guy's a miser. This guy's greedy. One line plus a few amplifications, but you can start with the one line. So suddenly you know how to role play this character without making everything up. You can change anything in the book when you're running your game, but we don't leave you hanging. It's not like one of those speeches where, my fellow countrymen, I will promise, and you turn the page and it's blank. Oh, right. And you go, uh-oh. You know, no, no, we give you enough that, and, and we tell you who has feuds with who else in the city? It's all there. The city. It's all about their social networks, their personalities. It's 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 kind of like a, the stat block for your social interactions with them. Their their social capital, their their street cred per se uh, within Athliath. And uh, this is something that we had been kind of like working on at Pendlehaven for the last three years because we saw this coming. We wanted to do a city system. We wanted. Another project that's coming down the pipe is we're doing the Mediterranean basin and all the the mythologies and, oh. and, and the lands around there. That's coming down the pipe for 2023. And there's gonna be a lot of diplomacy and cloak and daggerness and 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 social combat. And what we didn't want is, and again, I'll just pick on D D because everyone knows D D. You go into DM calls initiative. You're like, okay, well, 
we know we're in a combat for the next 45 minutes to an hour and a half. You know, it's like, okay, it's going to be a lot of crunch. It's going to be a lot of you know, strategizing and minis or whatever. But then the moment someone goes, okay, well, I want to convince the king to sign this peace treaty with this kingdom next door. Well, just do a charisma check, one roll. It's, it's hyper reductionist, right? You're taking this entirely super important scene. If you picture a movie that's happening, right? Right. Um, and you're boiling it down to one roll. You know, would you do that for a battle against Tiamat? Just right, no. strength check, go, see if you win, right? Um, so it's the same thing with the social combat system is there's enough steps and gates and leverage and you learn things about other uh, NPCs we call strings that then you can utilize and you've got street cred as well that you build up while you're in the city that give you bonuses to now be able to leverage your strength socially against those you meet. Um, and so it's, it's a lot more of a crunchy system. So if you've got that player that sits at the table, usually bored going like, oh, when's the fight going to happen? I just want to roll some dice, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, our social combat system is built in such a way that you don't need to wait for the violence. You can actually like have a really satisfying, nice, big social scene that plays out with a lot of drama and tension with some die rolls and, and it, it's got like swings back and forth and, and, and the negotiation and how things are going and but my lord why should i agree to that when i don't have to and i don't have to <laughs> so that's coming with the box set basically that's we've got four books in the box set and one of them is going to include social combat okay what are the other books obviously we've got the city yeah so ed mentioned there's one book which is the overview of the 96 city blocks okay 96 that's not counting the fortress that it's included as well in there, the docks, um, and the tent city that is outside the Western gate, which is absolutely massive. Uh, because what's happening as Ed alluded to is it's Ragnarok. It's the Celtic twilight. It's too late to stop the apocalypse. The apocalypse has begun. So everyone's kind of rushing to the city for safety. And there's the King, as Ed says, taxes as 100%. So everything is doubled. And so. There's a lot of people that can't afford this. So they end up basically gluing themselves up against the city gates on the outside and get taxed what? How much, Ed, on the outside? Just a Peasley, oh, what, 90%? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you see that the king's soldiers have to find them. When, they were, when you're outside in the tent city, you move around. Oh, no, that's not my tent. That That's his. <laughs> and you just you just go walk about. You know? Plausible deniability. Yeah. Right. Nice. But but if you have a city address, there's no escape in the tax collector. Nope. Not if you want to keep that address. Because if you don't, they'll just seize it for back exactly. taxes. <laughs> so the box set has how many books total? So that was the first book. Second okay. book is what we call the tour guide book. And Ed also described that one. That one is the deep dive. So you're getting a third of the city, roughly, that is a complete deep dive. So you've got a, a, a city block that is basically dissected. Every single one of those buildings is in full detail. You'll have menus. You'll have all the occupants. If there's a rooming house upstairs, you're going to get the people that are staying upstairs, uh, the guests, and, and why they're staying there, how long they're staying, who they know in the city, all the adventure hooks. So when players say, hey, I, you know, the GM's like, I need them to go straight. If they turn right or left, I'm, I'm, I'm out of ideas. Um, this box set is they go, oh, we're turning right, and we're going to go into the first door on the left. Um, the GM with zero prep and go, give me a second, flip, flip, flip. Okay. This is what you see. And this is what you have in front of you. So we want to present a city with zero prep, but we've seen other city products out there that require quite a bit of prep and quite a bit of like, just think on your feet, which is tough for a lot of people running a city adventure. Right. So what we wanted to do is just do all of the drudgery for you, like all the hard work for yeah. you. And if you want to make up stuff, make up stuff, but we've got a lot of that in print for you. So that's two books. Um, third book is the, uh, the rule system. So we've got the rule system for the city. Uh, so right now, uh, the rule system is going to be, there's going to be a section that's going to be agnostic. So we're going to talk about things like the street cred mechanics. We're going to be talking about the proclivities, characteristics, and, uh, dirty secrets and how to leverage them in your game. And we're going to include the Fate of Norns Ragnarok uh, rules in that booklet as well. So if you want to use this as a starting point to play in our game system, you've got the rule book right there at your fingertips. 
Um, and then the last book is your dweller creation or character creation book. Okay. And so this has a bunch of classes slash archetypes that you could play within the city, uh, the types of adventures that you would have in the city. Um, and these are, um, we're going to pad this out with a bunch of skills, talents, feats, um, and abilities that you would need for a city centric adventure. So for example, if your GM says, I love this box set, I want to use this with system X, but system X is very like hack and slash. And it does not give character classes a lot of options for, uh, c city interactions, right? Well, we're going to give you a bunch of these skills and abilities and talents to bolt onto your character classes of that system X that you can then utilize for your adventures within the city. Okay. So even if your system's lacking, we'll make up for it and we'll make sure you can adventure there. Nice. And then there's a glorious poster map. I was going to say, glorious. how big is that map? Um, so it was supposed to be 24 inch by 36 inch, but I think it's 48 inch by 24 inch. Okay. And that's so of the city, right? That's just the city. Yeah. Nice. And, um, it's paper to begin with. Ed's got this, this wonderful, uh, method of, of designing this on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper and laying them out on his table wow. um, as he's designing the city. And Ed will speak to his methods, which are unbelievably detailed, like to the point <laughs> where he's like, I'm going to tell your artist what kind of roof I want on these houses. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to have a, this legend and there's a reason for it. And Ed is a master of his craft. He's the best at city crafting because of this, this level of attention to detail. Right. Where he says, there's a reason why these buildings are in the construction materials that they are. And Ed, take it away. Like I'm speaking for you here. <laughs> oh. Sure. Okay. So if you're really rich and if you can, uh, like, if you own the walls of the city right up here, that's ST for stone. It's just like a castle wall. And for those listening, he's got a little mini map. So you have to, we'll, we'll, show, we'll yeah. throw clips on yeah. our Twitches and sure. Twitter and stuff. And then one step down from that is a stone building with a slate roof. And a step down from that is tile roof. And your building might be partial timber and stucco. You know, the, the, the so-called Tudor buildings you see that have black beams exposed and white, they may not be black and white, you know, but, but in that sort of construction. And some buildings will be hybrids. They'll have a stone ground floor, and then they've expanded up on top of it with um, wattle and daub, timber and stucco. And then you go down to uh, cedar shake roofs. And then you go down to board roofs. There are actually a lot of, particularly all the warehouses near the docks, they've got board walls and board roofs which means if you're on the Liffey in the depths of winter with all the fogs, everything is cold and damp. And if you're really poor and you live in a hovel, it'll have board walls and it'll have a woven like a, like a rush mat um, with, with twigs, uh, pa wall panels in between the things, and it'll have a turf roof, a grass roof which if you're smart, you grow things on that you can use to season. Right. You go, you'll have herbs on your roof. Um, if you're not smart, you'll grow something that somebody else wants to steal and suddenly you'll have a leak in your roof. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, and, and uh, if you're trying to hide from the city guards in the middle of the night, I mean, by day, uh, you, you have better hide amongst the crowds, keep dodging. But if by night, if you're... um. Um, going from roof to roof, sneak thieving, and the the king's soldiers see you and go, "Hi!" And by the way, we'll have details of the patrols in nice. the box set, obviously. Um, then the best thing you can do is find a good big grass roof and dig down into it and lie flat, because nice. it's the one thing you can maybe a not slide off of and b not be seen on, unless you can get to one of the nobles' mansions and climb five stories up and hide amongst the gables and, so, and chimneys and not fall off. <laughs> so yeah, there's a, and there's a reason for everything we've done. Um, I've only detailed floor plans of a few buildings so far because, Hey, I've got to give you the rest of the city. Right. I've got all these 96 blocks to do. Um, before I go back, say, Oh, floor plans. And, and of course you might want this before I die of old age. So I, <laughs> that might be one of the things we sort of have to gallop past and fill in later, but the point is we want to give you a city that you can use. We do the 
drudge work, so you don't have to. Your work can be on the adventure. And just having an adventure in the city, and not just having one adventure, there's enough depth and detail here that like a sitcom on television that has a, a stable cast of supporting characters that you see again and again, ideas for follow-up adventures will be generated at your gaming table by what you did to the innkeeper last time. Is he your friend now? Or does he hate your guts? Right. Or do you owe him? You know, and, and all that will play into it. And we've done all the detailing, so you can just end. Somebody can say, we need cheese. We need stinky cheese. Where I got this go? idea for a prank. Yeah, and we got all the shops, and this is what it costs. And if you want cheese with maggots in it, try this place. Uh, you know. So we have a game. We have a game on uh, that we do on Tuesdays. It's a Pathfinder game called Curse of the Crimson Throne. And our GM for that, he does so much work. And the entire, almost the entire, the majority of the game is set in a single city. And I was when he asked, offered for me to be in it. I was like, yes, because ever since I think even second edition, I always wanted to be like, it would be great to play in a game where you go from one to twenty, or you know beginning to end of the story without having to leave the city and not having to go, you know, fight in the forest or whatever, just the whole thing in a city. And I always thought that would be so great. And there's a lot of times where even in this, where they have the city and they have all these information, but it's, we're still like, okay, well, let's just pick one of these 10 million buildings they have on the map for X, Y, Z that we think might be there that we might need, you know, cause it's not really laid out. So something like what you're saying is just so nice to go. Yeah, I need, I need the, I would need the person that likes to do, that sells chickens. The guy that sells chicken on the street. Where, where can I find a good chicken? Or just like, I want to go eat food. You know, how many times do the role players say, you know, let's go eat food. Let's get something unique and different. Where do we go? And then the GM has to be like, okay, I got to think up some meals off the top of my head. Whereas oh, instead, no. and unique ones too, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and we've done the heavy lifting in Ask Liath. You'll have tons of menus. Yeah. So that's... And if, some, if somebody has a signature dish that is particularly vile or particularly wonderful and they're known across the city, that'll be called out. You want deep fried pickles? This is the place to go. Nice. But other people swear by that place over there. Yeah. And, and yeah, we, we'll, we do the work for you. This is a city. This isn't like... I drew a pretty map. It took me half an hour by my by my city. No, right. this is the city. Yeah, it's that's... well thought out. It's really, really well thought out. And there's, I'm there's a flow to it. There's a reason why the districts are where they are. Uh, there's a reason why the people are where they are and the reasons why they, they interact with the, uh, their neighbors and things like that. Um, like we started having our beta tests already in the city and like the city blocks just come together. We had like one scenario where um, I had the players escorting a uh, uh, an heiress from one of the kingdoms up north in Ireland down to Athcliath, because Athcliath is really Dublin in 930 AD. And um, she's inheriting a shop, and the shop's been run, uh, vacant um, since the previous owner uh, disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and she inherited it. And so she has to go and claim this. So the first thing is they have to go through the entire bureaucracy of the city of like, well, we have to pay taxes coming into the city for everything we've got on our cart. There's a weapon tax for armor and every weapon we're carrying in. Oh, crap. How come no one told us this? Could have like maybe arranged to leave some of the stuff behind. And so, you know, she's bringing in all her inventory and then they need to figure out where the shop is and, you know, what are all the laws governing, you know, her getting the 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 deed to the shop and then she's like listen i want to be you know in good with my neighbor so i want you to take some of my inventory and give it as gifts to all of the neighboring shops on the city block and so these guys got to go into every single one of these buildings and ed had them all already detailed of who is the owner of these buildings what what's their business and they got to meet all of her neighbors because their adventure is going to be to keep her business safe for the le first little while of their adventure while she gets her footing in Athcliath. And uh, and so, you know, just already the beta material that was pretty sparse at the time when we ran that first beta test was already just like a godsend to, to come up with all this stuff. Nice. You've also got some graphic novels and novels. We've already kind of talked about those. Um, and the art, is the artists, like you talked about Yulia doing the art for stuff, but she's not doing the art for the graphic novels, correct? 
No. So she's strictly for the Fate of the Norns Ragnarok RPG. So she's right. our, our our lead artist for that. We have other artists as well that work alongside her. Um, the graphic artist, the the ones for the graphic novels are Jonathan Borello for Every the Saga and Vincent Pompetti for um, uh, Brigades of the Firewolf. And how big are those graphic novels? I know you mentioned um, one of them uh, earlier being pretty thick. Yeah, thirty-two to forty-eight pages would okay. be like kind of the the running uh, length for a, a standard like comic book graphic novel out of France. We're trying to stick with the the standard format. Like, now I got to ask, just because you know people that don't necessarily collect graphic novels or comics might not understand uh, what kind of paper is being used in the printing of these. I'm, I'm curious myself. Is, is it just like you know? Notebook type paper? Is it like glossy? Is it you know? No, are are these going to be colored? Type. It's not comic book type paper. So it's, don't picture like DC or Marvel comics. Okay. Uh, this is kind of your art book. Picture like if you bought a cooking book. Nice. The the type of paper that you would have in there, where the art is absolutely just the colors just vibrantly pop up right off. So the best thing that I would say is like when people ask, I, I point them to the the Elric series of Stormbringer graphic novels that came out of France uh, in the early 2000s, I think. Uh, it's kind of the the model we're looking at emulating. So it's high quality paper with high quality print um, and almost full eight and a half by 11. It's slightly smaller. I, I don't have one handy right. next to me to, to give you the size. Um, so the next question is you've got stretch goals as well, kind of, kind of on there figured out. You got some adventures, uh, an adventure card deck. So tell me a little bit about some of these, uh, you know, what you have in this for stretch goals. Um, so the very first stretch goal we're going to have is that everyone that ordered print materials will get the PDFs for free. So that's going to be the very first stretch goal that, that appears. That's usually on all our Kickstarters. As soon as we pass like a couple of hundred bucks past the, uh, the, the, the funding goal, we'll give everyone PDFs along with whatever they ended up getting in print. Then we've got a bunch of guests, um, uh, game designers and authors. So I'll just name some of them off here. Um, so we had Phil on recently, Phil Brucato. He's the uh, one of the guys that did Mage, uh, the Ascension, a really big name in, in White Wolf. Yep. Um, so he would be doing an adventure for us. Uh, Ed Burrell, who's also done a bunch of stuff for like Morkborg, uh, some cards, um, adventure cards, um, and a great cartographer. I, I didn't even realize how prolific of a cartographer he was. So now at this point, I'm like, Ed? You're not only doing an adventure, but yours is going to involve a beautiful map as well. <laughs> um, and then uh, we got Ben McFarland. So if you're a Pathfinder player, you probably know Ben. He's he's done a ton of stuff for Pathfinder. Uh, Jay Sonia, who's done stuff for Pathfinder uh, 5e and his own systems. Uh, so another really good friend and a game designer, um, professional dungeon master. Uh, so this is someone I started watching during the pandemic. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, and he's like a longtime dungeon master that's played D&D, has a big critique of of how things are designed and how things should be run at the table. And he takes a very similar mentality to, to myself in terms of, let's put the player experience first, and then let's just hack the mechanics to reinforce a really good player experience. So uh, Professor Dungeon Master is going to be one of the authors. Uh, we've got Jason Anarchy from Jason Anarchy Games, who does... Um, a lot of drinking quest, like the old drinking quest series of games, a lot of Viking and drinking themes in his games. So he's going to be coming on board. You can picture a lot of humor there. Brian Neff, who's uh, really well known in the board game industry as well as a hired game designer. He's done a lot of the stuff like the legacy games. He's there for restoration games that have done a lot of the old uh, games that have come back to life, like the Dark Tower, the Fireball Island. Um, so he's going to be on board. Uh, Luke Gygax, the organizer of uh, GaryCon, and he's published a couple of things himself, uh, is on board. And Alex Kammer, who's also a uh, owner of a um, convention called GameholeCon, a uh, friend of both of ours. And uh, he's also one of the first people that said, yeah, absolutely, I'm, I'm on board writing an adventure for you guys. Uh, so all of these guys are, are ready to write these one-page adventures. So um, picture these as a very, very easy to pick up, like one pager that you take out of the, the box. It's like almost like light cardboard would be the, the paper that it would print it on. And on that one sheet, you've got everything you need to run your adventure, right? Wow. So so you've got like the whole plot synopsis, all your NPCs that you're gonna need or reference into your books, uh, the storyline, everything, uh, double-sided. 
If there's artwork that's necessary, it'll be on there. If there's a mini map that's needed, it'll be on there. But basically, the entire adventure is on this one piece of double sided paper. So, and it's all set in the city. Yeah, exactly. Amazing, amazing. And what's the uh, the the deck that I saw? <laughs> that's Ed's. <laughs> Come on, Ed, tell us about it. I'm I'm really curious. Okay, so picture a card deck, and instead of say a Magic the Gathering card, where there's a beautiful piece of art and a little bit of flavor text. And then it says, you know, draw one from discard, take this from your opponent's hand and all that stuff, the game mechanics. Okay. What if instead it has a cool title, like the lost book of the claw or something like that. I'm just making this up as we go. And then it says, you will need to find an innkeeper block caps who knows about the lost book and you'll need to find someone in the city who buys and sells books and collects them like a sage and so on and and you look at the card and you have and that way the norm the, the dungeon master the game master can look at that and say oh okay and then the players know okay i think we know of the right sort of innkeeper and they can go there and they can sort of see if they can piece together in this busy city the clues they need to move to the next thing of the adventure to get closer to this lost book or whatever it is in the right. adventure so what it's doing is sort of taking you by the hand and saying you may you may have lived here all your life but you may never been to the zoo it's right, right. over here and guess what um uh the reason this one's off by itself is because it eats people. And it ate a keeper last week. We're waiting for it to, um, we're waiting for his three gold finger rings to come out the other end. Oh. But in the meantime, um, we think it also swallowed a key. And this bone tube that some very upset lady said had a map in it. Find the upset lady. Oh, it was a treasure map. Oh, yeah. See, so you, so the they're kind of like little is... plot hooks, basically. Yeah, nice. It, but it's it's instead of saying, uh, well, the old D and D adventure hook, where it's a, it's a it's a mini paragraph that sort of says, you know, in a world, da 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 da. Have you found this? Oh my goodness, it lays golden eggs, and then just leaves you hanging. This is a why don't you go here, or maybe there? Which one would be better? You decide, and then. Maybe it'll lead you to here. So it's taking you all over the city and letting you choose with your knowledge the city, or you you can explore the city. Right. And then it just opens the city to you in a new way. You know, like uh, most of us live in a city, and it, it, this works in Athkleas too. You live here, you walk to work there, you work dawn to dusk, then you you find a place to drink or grab some food on the way home, then you go back to bed, lather, rinse, and repeat. Right. Okay, so you see a very small part of the city. Well, the, the adventure deck sort of says, hey, you may never have noticed, but there's a whole part of the city you never go into right over there. Yeah. And look at these things that are in it. So that's what this adventure deck is. Okay. Like that bridge that keeps collapsing to the north. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. The king can't seem to finish. <laughs> he keeps throwing money at it. Yeah. It keeps collapsing into the Liffey. Yeah. Well, that's really cool, and I hope I, I really hope that you guys hit all of your stretch goals. Uh, you know, obviously, Kickstarter, you never know if you're going to hit if you're going to hit your goal or if you're going to hit stretch goals or hit all of them and have to create more stretch goals. So uh, I hope you guys get to the point where you have to hit all of your stretch goals. When is the Kickstarter over with? How much time do people have? Give us a date. Seven days left. We're into the home stretch. One week. Um, so it's kind of like the uh, the mid campaign doldrums. Like if anyone's run a Kickstarter before, it's always like a big ramp at the first couple of days, but it just goes flat for a long time, and then there's just a huge pickup in the last like 48 hours, 72 hours. Yeah. Um, so um, it's actually been going up uh, during the the flat period, which I'm actually really happy. So I'm thank you for uh, for having us on, and hopefully we'll get a couple more eyeballs on our our hard work. That's one of the things that I'm, I, I keep saying. It's just so many amazingly talented people have just spent the last 18 months just shuttered in 
writing some amazing, amazing stuff uh, that's that's just ready for consumption. Um, so hopefully we can get all of this in everyone's hands. And hitting the stretch goals just means whatever your price was for your, your pledge level, you're just getting more for that same price. Right. We're just right. going to be throwing more stuff at you. Is this something where people can like pick and choose which parts they want, or is it like you get it all or nothing? No. Nope. So we've got uh, a, a breakdown. So you can go in at the first pledge level. The first, first pledge level is basically you pick and choose. So you pay a small amount just to be able to go like you know on a menu and say, I want this, 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 this. Uh, then we've got the digital uh, anthology. So if you just want everything on your iPad or whatnot, you can get everything in PDF. Um, and then there's the full print one. Uh, and then there's the gamer version, which is just the Athgliath board game, because we recognize also there's some people that are just gamers, and we're like, we don't read, we just roll dice. <laughs> right. So right. we've got that as an option as well. And you've got uh, PAX Unplugged, right? Tell us about that real quick. Oh, yeah, that's going to be our, our second uh, big convention in the States. So we just did Game Hole Con, uh, which was so, so much fun. It was our very first Game Hole Con. We had a blast. We're going back next year. And uh, PAX Unplugged is going to be our second one. So... Uh, hopefully, here's here's crossing our fingers and uh, that uh, Omicron doesn't end up closing any borders and we're stranded in the U.S. Uh, we can come back, but uh, it's this coming week, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Philly. Uh, so we'll be there, booth. Uh, let me just pull up the number here. We just posted that somewhere. Where's our where's our post? It's there somewhere. Look for it. Look for it. For those uh, listening, they're also on Twitch, so yeah, you can check them out. Fate of the What's the booth 431? number? 3431. 3431. 3431. And we will be running games every evening in our hotel, the Hilton, which is right next door to the convention center. So at the lobby of the Hilton, usually we've got a lot of good drinks poured for everyone, and we're either playing Gulveg, our, our trick-taking card game where there's a lot of bidding and bluffing, or we're playing uh, Vanaguard, which is a collaborative storytelling game where everyone takes... Uh, like a couple of minutes being the GM. So picture like in 60 minutes, you go on a full RPG adventure and everyone had a chance to be a GM. So that's that's one of our games. And then otherwise we'll be playing Ragnarok, which is our RPG. Awesome, awesome. You're also on Twitch. You have your own thing right here on Twitch, which is where we are currently live um, called Fate of the Norns or at Fate of the Norns. Uh, you do a thing called Fireside Chat where you chat with all kinds of people. It's really cool. I've been in there a handful of times. Ed, you are on Twitter at the Edverse. Uh, you can also find stuff all about him at fans of Green Ed Greenwood on Facebook. Uh, Andrew is at a Valkaskis. Uh, if you want to spell that A V A L K A U S K A S on Twitter, also at Fate of the Norns R on Twitter to find Fate of the Norns, uh, backslash Fate of the Norns on Facebook, fateofthenorns.com. Thank you, you two, for joining us. I really appreciate you stopping by and telling us about your Kickstarter because it's going to be awesome. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been fun. For those in the live stream, we will stick around for Q&A. Uh, people at the podcast that are listening in uh, and the people on the live stream next week, December 13th, we're going to have legendary comic book writer Chuck Dixon. So if you've ever read comic books, uh, you probably know who he is. He's done all of the Batman stuff throughout like the late 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, you know, all of the Batman, Robin, Nightwing, all of those guys, Superman stuff. He's done Conan, G.I. Joe. He's worked for Marvel, DC, IDW. The list goes on and on. So that's next week, December 13th. December 27th. Robert N. Charette, he is the creator of Shadowrun, uh, uh, all kinds of other games he's worked on. He's an author, he's an award-winning miniature sculptor. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of public appearances. He's going to be joining us on December 27th. That's going to be super cool. So if you like Shadowrun, uh, you should be excited for that. And January 10th, we're going to have Fight in the Box owner and game designer Seppi Yoon. He's going to tell us about all of his games. He's been all over the place. He's on all the social media. He's hilarious and a lot of fun. So for those listening to the podcast, uh, feel free to give a rate and review. We really appreciate it. We need that. Uh, if you leave a rating and a review, it tells people all about us and it helps us get more eyes on our product and gets more eyes on our guests, which is what we really want. So I want to thank you all for joining us and thank you for listening to Epic Realms. <laughs>